too. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, it's so great to be here with you tonight. When Pastor Weaver had invited me to come, I, I immediately said yes, because I just believe in missions. I'm excited about seeing the kingdom advance. It's great to hear about these churches, what is happening. Pastor Weaver drove me by the uh, construction uh, that is going to be taking place at your campus. It is just wonderful to watch the kingdom of God advance. So it's a privilege to be able to be with you. And uh, we came up from Springfield. I was expecting to see some fall colors, but it looks about the same here as it does in Springfield. So it's been a a uh, mild uh, fall, at least it has for us. I wish my wife Debbie could be with me, uh, but she is uh, involved with the Design for Life conference that they're getting ready for online. Thank you. She'd love that, that somebody was cheering. And uh, so that will be coming up in a couple of weeks, and she's been busy taking care of that. And tonight she's watching four of our eight grandchildren, so she's got her hands full. And, uh, but Justin Smith is traveling with, with me, one of our pastors from James River. Tonight what I want to do is I want to just take a few moments and talk to you about a principle that if it goes from your head to your heart, it will absolutely revolutionize your life. It will release God's blessing in your life, but more than that, it will enable you to give to things like tonight or other things that God touches your heart with in the, in the weeks and the months and the years to come, should the Lord tarry, things that will advance the kingdom, to give with a liberality that maybe you haven't yet experienced in your life. I want to talk to you about the law of the harvest. Maybe you've heard about the law. I grew up on a farm, and, and so it's very natural for me. I, I grew up on a three generations of Lindells had farmed the land, and, and I know this, that when I would watch harvest and I would, would see the harvest coming in, it was an exciting time. It was a time of joy. It was a time when we celebrated what God was doing. And God wants that same kind of joy to be in our hearts as we think of investing in the kingdom. The law of the harvest is called a law because it's a law just like the law of gravity. It's a law that was established by God. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, the Lord said this to Noah, as long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. In other words, God's established this law. It is a part of the world in which we live. And so the law of the harvest is something that God has established so you and I can give with joy and give with confidence, knowing that God is going to do something, not only in the projects that we give to, but God is going to do something in our own life. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, when he is encouraging the Corinthians to give to the church in Jerusalem, to the needs that were there, what does Paul appeal to? He doesn't spend as much time in Corinthians talking about the needs in Jerusalem as he does explaining the law of the harvest. I find that very interesting because a lot of times when we talk about the law of the harvest or we talk about this principle, people can have a tendency to say, well, I don't think it's about that. You wouldn't find the Apostle Paul saying that. The Apostle Paul felt it was very important that you and I would understand how God views the whole area of giving. Now, as we think about the law of the harvest, I want, to give you, I want to give you four laws, and maybe you would write them down. In fact, I would encourage you to, because I think as you pray about your giving, as you think about what you're going to do, not only this coming Sunday, but what you're going to do throughout uh, the month of October, and I prayed so get into your heart that you would think about this any time 
there's an opportunity to give. There are four laws of the harvest. The first one is this. You reap what you sow. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6, Paul says, a man reaps what he sows. The New Living Translation puts it this way. You always harvest what you plant. If you want a harvest of corn, what should you plant? You should plant corn, right? Wouldn't it be terrible if you planted watermelon seeds and got cauliflower? I hate cauliflower. You reap what you sow. This is a principle that applies to all of life, not just money, but every aspect of our life. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, Paul says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You reap what you sow. That is true in absolutely every area of life. The writer of Proverbs says this, A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24. If you want friends, be friendly. If you want to have friends, sow friendship. Why? Because you'll reap what you sow. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, Jesus in the Beatitudes said this, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. If you want to receive mercy, you've got to sow mercy. If you're harsh, if you're overbearing, if you're critical, then that's what you will reap. It's also true in the area of forgiveness. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you want to receive forgiveness, you have to sow forgiveness. Jesus goes on to say, but if you refuse to forgive, your Father will not forgive your sins. If you sow unforgiveness, you reap unforgiveness. If you sow forgiveness, you reap forgiveness. It's the law of the harvest. It's the law of the universe. It's woven into life. God set it up that way. Now, with that being said, in a verse that I'll repeatedly quote to you tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. This is a tremendous encouragement as we think about giving. Paul writes this, and he's not talking about gardening. He's talking about money. He's talking about taking an offering. And he says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He uses this as an example, or uses the law of the harvest, and as an example of how it works relative to giving. If you sow money, you will reap money. I'm going to say it again, because a lot of Christians are like, that's prosperity gospel, I don't believe that. It's the word of God. You sow money, you reap money. As I didn't write it, Paul wrote it, okay? It's in the Bible. You sow money, you reap money. Here's what people say to me all the time. They say, well, you know, I think you give and God blesses in a lot of ways. You'll never get an argument from me on that. God does bless in a lot of ways, but that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, if you sow money, you reap money. This is an important thing for Christians to understand. This will change how you view absolutely everything relative to your giving. When I am giving money, I'm sowing, I'm planting a seed. 
And when I plant that seed, it's going to grow. And there is going to be a harvest. It is a seed that brings a harvest. If I sow money, I'm going to reap money. So the first law is you reap what you sow. Now, there's a second law of the harvest, and that is you reap after you sow. Paul says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap bountifully. What comes first, sowing or reaping? Sowing does. At times, people will say to me, well, you know, Pastor, if I get it, I'll give it. But no farmer says, well, when I get a great big harvest, you can count on me to put seed in the ground. It doesn't work that way. You sow first. That takes great faith. If you're a believer and you're a farmer, then your faith is in the Lord. But if you're not a believer, then your faith is either in yourself or it's in your hard work or it's in the soil but most often it's in the seed. Every farmer understands that the seed has within it the ability to produce. It's the law of the harvest. And he knows this, if he wants to have a harvest, he has to sow. He knows it's gonna take time for the harvest to take place. The seed has to germinate, it will have to produce fruit, so a farmer, if we're going to use the illustration of corn, he may plant corn in April, and it will mature, and he will harvest it in October, approximately six months later. And the sooner you sow, the sooner you reap. I know this growing up on the farm. Uh, my dad would always be out watching, and all the farmers would, get, would be ready for the first good weather, the first time the ground had dried out, to get out in the field, and it was, a, it was game on. It was a race. Who got the crop in the field first? It's how it went, because everybody understood, the sooner I sow, the sooner I will reap. But you reap after you sow. Now, here's a third principle. You reap more than you sow. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You reap more than you sow. For example, I have an ear of corn here, and if I take one little kernel off this ear of corn and I plant it in the ground, all things being equal, it will produce three ears of corn. It's the law of the harvest. I sow one seed, I get three ears of corn, each with 600 kernels on it. That's over 180% return. It's an amazing thing, really, when you think about it. It's the law of the harvest. You reap more than you sow. I l listen, this has been my testimony throughout, or my experience throughout all of my time of pastoring. We came to James River Church and there was a godly man uh, in the church. He was one of the reasons why I wanted to come to the church. His name was E.M. Clark. Uh, some people will know who he was. He was a, a uh, president at North Central Bible College. Prior to that, he'd been an Illinois district superintendent. But when he was in his 80s, he helped raise millions of dollars for the kingdom. And I would go and I would sit at Clark's house and and he would talk to me, and one of the things that he delighted in was just simply talking about the joy of giving and the law of the harvest. Brother and Sister Clark, into their 60s, had never saved for retirement ever. They'd never made enough in the places where they were at to have anything set aside. But from the time of their mid-60s, to the time that he died when he was in his 90s, they gave away millions of dollars. I asked him how it was possible, and he said this, I don't know. He said, the Lord seems to give it to me faster than I can give it away. It is the law of the harvest. You reap more than you sow. That as you think of your giving, 
You don't have to be afraid to give. Invariably, here's what people think. Well, if I give my resource to God, it's less for me. And God says, no, you've forgotten the law of the harvest. That whatever I give is now placed in his hand for him to multiply back into my life. Whatever it is that you invest, God sees it as seed you're planting in the ground. There is the tithe. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It's first, the first 10% of what you make. We teach that regularly. But then beyond that, there's the over and above giving. And the law of the harvest is it applies to our giving to the Lord. I believe especially in that area. Last year at a missions convention or our missions emphasis, I was sitting there. One of my sons was preaching the message as he was preaching. I was listening and I was under conviction because he was saying this. He said, you know, he said, don't be afraid or don't, don't, don't. we get a lot of times we get in a rut in our giving and we have thresholds, we have levels of giving that we don't go beyond. But your giving is not just what you can do. If you and I were going to budget our giving, guess what? It would be much less. He said, you know, what, what is it that you believe God could channel through you? What is it that you believe God could do? And, and would you be willing to step out in faith? And I thought, you know what? My giving is based on what I, I realized as I was sitting there looking at my little card, I was going to fill out my faith promise card. I realized that I was basing it on what I thought I could give rather than what God was speaking to my heart. One of the things I want to encourage all of you to do is it's not what do you think you can do? It's what do you think God can do through you? And what do you think God wants to multiply in your life? There's the law of the harvest, and you'll never outgive God. I just simply want to encourage you. There will never be a time, God will never owe a person anything. That when you and I invest, we're planting seed in the ground, and you always get more back in return. In fact, Paul says this later in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll be enriched in every way for all your generosity. In other words, the idea is it's not that I'm giving to get, it's I'm giving knowing I don't have to worry. God's going to take care of me. He's going to, he is going to multiply it back to me and I'm going to be able to do more. In fact, I've made it a goal, Debbie and I, have made it a goal. We never want the best we've ever done to be the yardstick for the rest of our life. We always want to be stretching in our faith. I want to be in a place where I have to pray it in. I want to be in a place where I say, Lord, I want to live on the edge in my giving. I, because I, I know this. Jesus said if we don't know how to manage material wealth, how will we ever be entrusted with spiritual wealth? The idea is I, I just simply want to see God do big things in my life. And a part of that is in my own control based on my willingness to give, to be willing to say, Lord, none of it is mine to hold on to for myself. All of it is yours, and I want to invest in the kingdom, and I don't have to worry about not having enough because God has said there's a law of the harvest, and John you will reap more than you sow. That leads me to a fourth principle of the law of the harvest. You reap based on how much you sow. You and I determine the size of our harvest. You say, no, I, I thought God does that. No, you determine the size of your harvest. It's very clear in scripture. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. The person who sows a little, they've determined that they will only reap a little. The person who sows generously, they're going to reap generously. If you sow little, you reap little. I mean, I understand the law of the harvest. In some ways, it comes very easy to me because, again, growing up on a farm, if you wanted, uh, when I was growing up, and I mean, our, our soil is not as good as Iowa soil. 
but I grew up in eastern Colorado. So, but if they could have, if we could have a, a harvest of 200 to 220 bushels per acre, that was good. In order to do that, though, you had to plant 36,000 kernels of corn per acre. A farmer knows that. A farmer calibrates the planter. If a farmer goes out and says, I'm expecting a 200 bushel per acre harvest, but I'm only planting 12,000 seeds, everybody look at him and say, you're crazy. It doesn't work that way. In order to reap a certain amount, you have to sow a certain amount. In other words, the farmer determines the size of his harvest. Listen, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give and you will receive. I mean, if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. In other words, God is always going to give back more than you gave. It's the law of the harvest. But listen to this. The amount you give, this is Jesus speaking, still Luke 6, 38, in the New Living Translation, the amount you give will determine the amount you give back. You determine your harvest. I, I'd like to have a volunteer come up on the stage. Let's see. Uh, the, well, the face mask uh, right beside. There, there you go. Well, no, I'll take, I'll, I'll take either one of you. So, okay, you, you got it. What is your name? Taylor. Taylor? Taylor, how long have you attended New Hope? 30 years. 30 years. Oh, are you? Is this your daughter? All right. Great. What do you do? What, where do you serve at New Hope? Um, I sing in the choir, and yeah, that's about it. I'm, well, that's a good thing to and, do. And I manipulate the pastor. You manipulate the pastor. Well, that, that can be hard to do, but you got an edge because you're his daughter. Come on over here, Taylor. I'm going to have you stand right over here. And what I want you to do is I want, I'm going to give you a kernel of corn, and then what I want you to do is I just want you to hold it in your hand like this. Okay, can you do that? Yeah. Okay, so put your hand over. Taylor has one kernel of corn in her hand. Now, you know, some people have more, some have, some have less. So we could, we could easily put two more in there. Or now she's got like three and, three and a half. So Taylor has that corn in her hand. And here's the thing. God has given her seed. The issue is, what's she going to do with it? Everybody in this room, God has given you seed. To, to every person has something. We don't all have the same. That's not the point. The issue is, God has given us something. That's what tonight is really about. What are you going to do with what God has given you? If Taylor holds on to the seed and she doesn't plant the seed, there's not going to be a harvest. If Taylor eats the seed, if she consumes it on herself, there's not going to be a harvest. The only way there can ever be a harvest for Taylor is if she lets go of the seed. Here's what a lot of people, what it's like. Just keep your hand closed. A lot of people, God comes along and God wants to bless them, but they're so busy hanging on to their, to their seed that the blessing, it just goes off. They can't contain it. They don't, have any, they don't have any ability to take more, to take in more, because they won't release what they have. And God is a generous God. And when we, when we let the seed go, so release the seed, just turn your hand over and now hold your hand out, then God begins to pour in more. Only God doesn't just sprinkle it in. No, go ahead and release. Go ahead and release the seed. You can let it, you can turn it over there. See, and the more she does, the more she, she is able to receive. And God begins, you know, so what God wants to do is, God wants to begin to pour it, and now release it. Yeah, there, look, <laughs> they're gonna love you here at this convention center. So uh, what happens is, the more she releases, the more she can receive. I'm sorry. But if she never lets it go, she's, 
she's done receiving from the Lord. So she can, as long as she's open-handed with the Lord, watch it. She's planting. Only you know what? God isn't going to just pour it out like this a little bit at a time. I think God's got a lot bigger bucket than that. What God does is when you and I, God wants to pour it out like that. God wants to, as you release the seed, release it, release it, open-handed, open-handed, open-handed. That's what God, thank you. Let's give Taylor a big round of applause as she empties her shoes. That's what God wants to do in your life. The question is, really for us, will we hear from the Lord and will we in faith say, God, it's not about what I can budget. It's not about what I can do. It's what you are speaking to my heart. And when we, in faith, step out and then don't just sit and say, well, God, when you give it, I will, I will give it back but immediately start to plant seed. Immediately start to give. I tell people, listen, whether it's, uh, it's missions or it's building or whatever it is, get the seed in the ground. The best thing you could do is to give as much as you can, as quick as you can in missions and watch what God does. God will never owe a person anything. And you're the one who determines the size of your harvest. And as you give to the Lord, you're going to see the Lord pour into you beyond what you could ask or what you could imagine. But you are the one who determines the size of your harvest. And here's the joy in giving. Especially, I, I, I mean, I think any one of the things you're talking about, whether it's the building you're creating room for boys and girls to hear the gospel to have it planted in their heart. That's going to, if the Lord Jesus Christ tarries, you're investing, you're creating space for those children to hear. And that, there's going to be a, an incredible harvest. You're going to meet people in heaven who are going to say, I'm there because you gave to the church at Leon. I'm there because you gave to the church up at Cedar Rapids and Waterloo. I'm there because you gave to the church, uh, the, the African church. I'm there because you gave to New Hope, to whatever it is. I'm there because you helped support the, the missionaries who are going out, who are going to the Muslim world, the Live Dead Project, and the other places. I'm I'm in heaven. You're going to have friends for eternity. And you're going to have the joy of knowing that the gospel has been advanced. And simply, simply this, you don't have to be afraid to give. Most people are afraid to give. Most people think, if I give the money, I've lost it. That's completely wrong. The only thing you ever keep, honestly, is what you gave away. And you never have to be afraid to give because God says, I will multiply it back to you. Why? So you can give again. So you can increase your liberality. You'll be generous. And when you begin to live that way, it changes how you view money. It changes, I would say, how you, how you view ministry and how you treat people. The happiest people in the church that I pastor are the generous people because they just simply want to invest and give. You know, because I've learned this. When people have a generosity of spirit, it, it comes out not only in their finances, it comes out in the way they talk about others. It comes out in the way they live. It comes out in the way they serve. It comes out in the way they, they view situations and, situations and circumstances. And I just pray for new hope and for the people here tonight that God would take new hope and would take each one of you to a new level of generosity, of generous living in your giving, in your serving, in your speaking, in your believing, that you'd believe God for big things because you've come to understand he's a God who has unlimited supply of all that we need. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for New Hope Church. I thank you for the foundation that Pastor Weaver has laid over the last 30 years. And Lord, for the amazing ministry that's happened as a result 
and to think the best is yet to come. That if, if Jesus, if you tarry, this church is going to continue to grow and impact not only West Des Moines, but it's going to impact the, the state, the country, and the world in ways that none of us can imagine tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would set your hand upon this church and that, oh God, it would rise up in a new spirit of generosity and that, Lord, you would pour out your blessing on your people, that, God, you would enrich their harvest, that they might be generous on all occasions in all kinds of ways, that the gospel might advance, that souls might come to know you for the glory of God. Father, let faith rise in every heart. I pray as people go home tonight, Lord, as we lay down to sleep, that, Father, you would speak to hearts concerning our giving. I pray, oh God, as husbands and wives talk, that you would speak to them about their giving and their living. And, Lord, that you would call them to a new level of generosity. And, oh God, may you open the windows of heaven and may you pour out so much blessing they cannot begin to contain it. And Lord, I thank you for it. I look forward to what you're going to do. And Lord, we just praise your name. You're a good God. You're a generous God. You're the gift-giving God, James says. And Lord, may we follow your example. In Jesus' name, amen.